After we are recording. Okay, so welcome everybody to the latest talk in the RACT network. Today we are joined by Ted Peters, who's author of UFOs, God's Chariots, question mark, Spirituality, Ancient Aliens, and Religious Yearnings in the Age of Extraterrestrials. He's also co-editor of Astro Theology, Science and Theology Meet Extraterrestrial Life. And as a scholar, he specializes in the interaction between science and religion. He's a past MUFON field investigator. You'll have to tell us what that is, Ted. And <laughs> once served as MUFON's Louisiana State Director. He currently serves as co-editor of the journal Theology and Science. His website, I'll include a link to that in, uh, in the description so we can look at that. But it's tedstimelytake.com. And his blog post, Would Confirmation of Extraterrestrial intelligent life cause a crisis for terrestrial religion so i think we're in for uh, a treat today um i think i'll just hand over to you ted uh, maybe yeah maybe expand on that a little bit and then it into your your talk let's uh, yeah well you. Uh, thank you um richard and thanks for your racs uh, <laughs> leadership uh bringing us uh together this is a small group but it's a mighty group uh, let me uh, try to get on share screen and uh, somehow or other, I feel like I'm not dressed properly unless I have slides. And I think I see it here. Okay. There we go. Okay. Well, astrobiologists and ufologists share the same barbecues. Or not? Do they have barbecues in uh, Great Britain? I I, uh, I wonder. Okay, so yes, yes, we do. Uh, yeah. You do. Okay. <laughs> when it's not raining, yeah, yeah, <laughs> we all rush out while it's not raining quickly. Right. Well, uh, let's start with uh, astrobiology and ufology. When I was a kid uh, growing up near Detroit in Michigan, my mom and dad read the flying saucer books and they were uh, devotees of George Adamski, a famous contactee of the 1950s. Uh, and uh, when they were done reading the books, I would read them. And by the time I was in the seventh grade, I was the neighborhood expert on flying saucers. And of course, the extraterrestrial hypothesis that went uh, with it. And like so many of us, when we go to the university, we put away childish things. And I forgot about the subject until I became a professor <laughs> and found the students all excited about flying saucers, UFOs, and ancient astronauts. So what I did then was I took what I'd learned in graduate school from the theology of Paul Tillich and uh, had, well, I was teaching world religions at the time and the phenomenology of Mercia Iliada. And I thought I could see in the UFO phenomenon through a cultural analysis that it was a religious phenomenon. <laughs> and that got confirmed a little bit in uh, late 1979 uh, with the movie uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind uh, in which uh, the director Spielberg said, I was going to make a sci-fi movie. And then I discovered that UFOs are a religious phenomenon. So uh, I want to do cultural analysis to demonstrate the religious dimensions of the uh, UFO phenomenon, but I had to join the UFO organizations and uh, interview people and uh, et cetera over the years, which I've done, and I fell in love with the subject, still love the subject, and... Um, uh, would love to get invited to more ufology barbecues than I currently do. When it comes to astrobiology, uh, in the late 1990s, uh, I became friends and colleagues with some astrobiologists at NASA and SETI, and uh, also the Vatican Observatory, 
and have gotten really interested in what space researchers, uh, <clears throat> Jose Funes is an example of one of those um, space uh, researchers. And um, in re recent years, just before COVID, every summer, a friend of mine at SETI, Doug Vakoch, would have a barbecue in his house. He had a big backyard. And a lot of his NASA and SETI friends would come to that barbecue, and so would I. And that's where I got the idea. Why is it that we're no no ufologists at Doug's barbecues? Well, the astrobiologists think that ufology is a pseudoscience. So what I want to do is explore that split, because what they both have in common is a lot of thinking about extraterrestrial intelligence. So here's Jill Tarter, longtime director of uh, SETI Institute. And uh, we were on a research uh, project together. So that blue shoulder behind Jill's left shoulder, that's actually mine. <laughs> and uh, Jill says, astrobiology is the science. And I'm gonna say a lot about science today that deals with the origin, evolution, distribution, and future of life in the universe, past, present, and uh, future. And you're probably familiar with the astrobiology roadmap uh, that has guided NASA research for 20 plus years now. How does life begin and evolve? I think it's very important to flag that in the self-understanding of astrobiology, we are evolutionary biologists. Uh, that's going to be very important in what I'm going to be saying in a couple of minutes. <clears throat> Does life exist elsewhere in the universe? And how do we search for life with our, our uh, methods? Now, <clears throat> let's go to MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. Established in 1969 um, by amateurs, but that's when the Condon Report was published in the United States, stating that the study of UFOs has no scientific value of any kind. So note what MUFON's self-understanding is. We're here for the Scientific study of UFOs for the benefit of humanity. Two things to flag. First, a scientific mindset. Then secondly, and this is buried in there, but I'm going to try to unbury it. Science is our savior. So the scientific study of UFOs will contribute to the benefit of humanity. Why do those things go together? Um, I've been, uh, and I think maybe some of you are uh, have shown interest in SCU, the Scientific Coalition for UAP Studies. This is a new group of um, hard-nosed empirical scientists who like the word data, <laughs> and they want the study of uh, unidentified aerospace phenomena to become credible. And on the one hand, uh, this group wants to devise measuring methods uh, for rigorous scientific examination of UAP. On the other hand, uh, some, not all, but some members of the group uh, do believe in the extraterrestrial hypothesis, but feel that they want to talk about it uh, within a context uh, of uh, rigorous science. I see a small way, maybe you do too, I don't know, uh, of interest in connecting um, UFOs with uh, serious science. This is, uh, you know what? <laughs> I just betrayed my prejudice. Serious science is established science. <laughs> um, and uh, ufology is thought to be pseudoscience. But uh, one of my points is that from a cultural point of view, uh, both astrobiologists and ufologists have great respect for science and even think of science as salvific in character. 
A Galileo project, uh, not so much in the news now, but a year ago, this was the hot topic. Avi Loeb, astronomer at Harvard, gathering together uh, blue ribbon scientific researchers to deal with unidentified aerial phenomena or UFOs and uh, trying to get uh, money from the U.S. Uh, Department of Defense to fund uh, the research. Avi Loeb himself uh, believes in the extraterrestrial hypothesis and uh, etc., but uh, basically uh, wants, like SCU, uh, to um, uh, exact scientific rigor in the study of unidentified aerial phenomena. And uh, again, uh, more evidence that there is a bit of a wave right now of uh, rigorous scientific interest in unidentified aerial phenomena. I would mentioned to Jose Octavio Chantores, uh, I've never met him in person, but he and I have been working <clears throat> together for five years or so. And uh, he and I, together with two other uh, scholars, put together this book published a year ago, Astrobiology, Science, Ethics, and Public Policy. There's no <clears throat> religion or theology in this book. It's simply what's going on in the science. Uh, it's uh, the implications of astrobiology for society uh, and what are the ethical issues <clears throat> that should go into public policy making. Uh, then um, I connected Octavio with Jensen Andreessen for this second book, Extraterrestrial Intelligence. Now, Jensen is an experiencer, and uh, she's quite confident that um, she has been in touch or, uh, with uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. And uh, so what we have in this book is uh, actually astrobiologists and ufologists at the same barbecue, if you call it an intellectual barbecue. And so here's Chan Torres, who's got one foot in each barbecue. A scientist who engages with UAP does not automatically become a pseudoscientist, since he or she would not be asserting anything in particular in a manner a priori. I think if um, an establishment scientist wants to criticize a ufologist, that criticism is likely to be that the ufologist has an a priori belief in extraterrestrial life, which uh, skews <laughs> uh, the research, and uh, the ufologists need to defend themselves on that uh, from that particular accusation. Now, here's Stan Friedman, and if you're not into ufology, you don't know Stan, but he was a colorful character, died just recently, but I want to lift him up as, um, as an example of what's going on. Stan, already when I was a kid, was delivering lectures around the country um, saying that extraterrestrials are real, they are visiting Earth, and flying saucers, and he would say the evidence for the existence and visitation of ETI is stronger than you would require in a court case to convict uh, uh, a defendant. And he would brag about his scientific credentials. He said he was a physicist, a nuclear physicist. And if a nuclear physicist can believe in ETI and UFOs, then the rest of us can as well. So what I want to uh, illustrate here is that among in the, in the group of so-called UFO believers, there is a scientific mindset, and that belongs to the wider culture which has, right down to the present time, utmost respect for the scientist to be the arbiter of truth or falsity. So uh, here's a little argument that Stan has with Seth Shostak, whom you may or may not know, is an astrobiologist at SETI, and he's an excellent writer. 
uh, has written some uh, some interesting books and articles. He's a, he's, he's a, a scientist uh, with quite a personality, and so and Stan had uh, personality plus. As I mentioned, I think Stan died just a couple of years ago. So Stan says, my biggest gripe with the city believers, including Seth Shostak, is that they have refused to consider the evidence related to alien visitation. So Stan is going to outscience the scientists. They already assume with no evidence provided at all that there are aliens sending radio messages and that nobody is coming to Earth establishing colonies or migrating, they are the true disbelievers. Well, Stan loved to uh, debate, but note what's going on here. There's a kind of uh, contest. Who is more scientific, the ufologist or the astrobiologist? Now, here's uh, Chris Impey, um, and you may or may not know him, Chris uh, actually was or maybe still is director of the astrobiology program at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And uh, Chris is one of those scientists who's very sensitive to cultural uh, issues. And again, like Seth Shostak, he's a good writer and uh, uh, tries to uh, bridge um, science with uh, culture and uh, society. He's not going to go to a ufology barbecue or invite ufologists to his barbecues. Why am I a UFO agnostic? I think it's likely that there is advanced life with technological capabilities somewhere in the universe and maybe in our galaxy. But the way UFOs present themselves doesn't pass the smell test. So uh, ufology fails the smell test. Uh, now, here's a colleague that I work with, uh, Carl Peterson, a physicist in um, Columbus, Ohio, and uh, he had a piece in that book that Octavio Chantores and Jensen Andreessen edited on ETI, and note his um, disposition is the same as what we saw with Chris Impey. Uh, much of the UAP data that has been gathered, sightings, videos, and witness accounts, are not high quality physics data. They lack sufficient credibility in supporting evidence. So, okay, ufologists, you're not coming to my barbecue. Now, I'd love to have uh, Jose comment on the Vatican Observatory. Uh, recall a few years ago that the current director, Guy Consolmagno, uh, had, in conversation with the Pope, said that if a Martian were to land and get out of a spaceship, they would baptize the Martian if and only if the space visitor asked for baptism. But Guy is not going to invite a ufologist to his barbecue. What does he say? We have no artifacts from UFOs in our labs. None. Zilch. We have nothing to test. Thus, my skepticism remains. And um, in uh, my on and off connection with the Vatican Observatory over the years, I don't ever remember the subject of UFOs coming up. So uh, it will be uh, nice to hear Jose uh, talk about this later because uh, Jose was... Um, uh, director of the Vatican Observatory uh, during John Paul II's uh, uh, pontificate, and uh, he may uh, give us some interesting elaboration uh, later on about this. Well, okay, I want to divide this talk into two uh, components. What do astrobiology and ufology share in common? They share the scientific mindset, um, uh, and I, I'm speaking culturally there because um, I, I'm not analyzing the so-called methods of investigation on the part of ufologists. I just want to say they believe that science is a good thing and that science is the arbiter of truth or falsity when it comes to the extraterrestrial hypothesis. 
Now, I would like to go into the ETI myth. And by myth here, I mean a framework of interpretation. What are the presuppositions, so to speak, um, that frame um, the understanding of extraterrestrial intelligent life uh, in such a way that we can look for it and know what it looks like when we find it. And as I said before, it all hangs on the theory of evolution. So here is the um, ETI myth in a nutshell. This is actually a t-shirt that I bought at the 1997 50th anniversary of the Roswell uh, crash. And uh, so you can see that intelligent creatures have evolved on earth, but on, on, on another planet, there is a higher stage of evolutionary advance. So let's take a look at the Handbook of Astrobiology. There's one article, Eric Corpola writes, any ETI we do encounter is likely to be far more technologically advanced than our own. That word advanced, that's a key to what's going on in the myth. Um, here is an article in the MUFON UFO Journal. We must assume that ET, ETs arriving at Earth have superior technology. What's going on here is a conflation of technological progress with evolutionary development. We must assume that ETs arriving at Earth have superior technology as they possess travel capabilities far beyond those presently available to Earth's people. So I want to say the myth um, is uh, that's an extra scientific belief. <laughs> uh, it seems to be shared uh, by both groups. Um, this myth doesn't necessarily have to tell a story, but most myths do, and this one has the story, and it is the story of the evolution of life, both on Earth and off Earth. It starts from non-life with abiogenesis, and then it follows the long trail of increased complexity, and we import the doctrine of progress. I, I want to say that's very important because most evolutionary biologists deny that there's an entelechy or any principle of progress built into evolution, but the ETI myth requires that evolution be progressive. So advanced complexity leads to intelligence. And how do we measure intelligence? Well, through science and technology, of course. You don't measure increased intelligence by the arts or the humanities, you measure it through science and technology. And uh, so we can see that in the future, um, a more intelligent species than ours will be more advanced, not in music, but in science and technology. And then finally, the eschatology, science will save us from self-destruction on planet Earth. And um, so using the methods of Paul Tillich and Marcia Iliada, I wanna say uh, there's something inherently religious about the belief system in the ETI myth, and that makes it extra scientific, not that it's wrong or not that it's bad. I just wanna say there's something more than science going on here. Okay, um, let's take a look at this picture. And it, it's a very large mural, hangs on the wall just outside the office of a friend of mine, Chris McKay, who's an astrobiologist at NASA. And uh, so Chris and I were walking out of his office on one occasion and we just stopped <laughs> to study this picture. Now let's look at the story. What's happening? I don't know if you can see my cursor here or not. Can you? So um, we're going back now 4.5 billion years 
the planet Earth is getting bombarded by objects from space. The molten planet is forming, and that's what you get in the upper left-hand corner. And then in the oceans, you get abiogenesis, in which non-life is becoming life. And then follow the trajectory to the development of DNA. Uh, in uh, this comes from the the uh, end of Darwin's Origin of Species. Remember, he has that little pond that gets struck by lightning, and um, then uh, non-life becomes uh, living, and that became the principle of the miller oubre experiments in 1952. And that seems to be uh, going on uh, here. You can uh, see something that looks like lightning that might be responsible for the um, origin of life. So life then becomes increasingly complex in the ocean as we follow it from left to right. And then, of course, life crawls onto the, uh, the earth, the dry land. Uh, eventually, and then we get the, the dinosaurs, and uh, then we go the upward trail where we get human life. Now, human life is not at the top of the mountain, is it? No. Um, that's where our cave-dwelling ancestors are found, but evolution doesn't stop. No, it keeps going as we develop science and technology and at the very top of the mountain what do we find the astronomer the astrobiologist and we've got the radio telescope turned towards the heavens that is so obvious in the phenomenology of religion it's the axis monday it's the connection between heaven and earth and it's not the religious priest that connects heaven and earth no it's the scientist and one of the things about the great myths of ancient Egypt and uh, Babylonian others, you told the myth in order to give heavenly authority to the king. And so what we've got here is the king on earth is the scientist. And the heavens are giving authority to the most highly evolved homo sapien, the natural scientist. I want to suggest this is doing theology without a license. So here's Jill Tarter, and uh, how does the ETI myth manifest itself in Jill's thinking? So she starts with this assumption, again, that most evolutionary uh, biologists will not grant, but it's extremely important, that the ETIs uh, will be far older than we, which means then if evolution is progressive, that means they'll be more advanced. Uh, here on Earth, there was a fall into sin and darkness, and that fall is called religion. So the ETI's longevity is inconsistent with organized monotheistic religions on Earth. Such religions are responsible for the longest lasting warfare and destruction. So we have warfare and destruction on Earth because of the human fall into religion. So the only thing that can save us is to get beyond our religion and become scientific. And we're struggling with that on earth. Could extraterrestrial science save us? So we have an eschatology. Once we have made contact, with a more highly evolved and more highly advanced ETI, there will be no, no sex anymore, no religious sex. There will be a highly established code of ethics. And uh, I think that Jill's um, doctrine of salvation looks like ancient Gnosticism in the sense that um, it's salvation through knowledge. They, the ETIs, may tell us how it's possible to transition from a my God versus your God conflict, remember religion is the sin, to a more stable universal religion characterized by understanding. So um, 
I, if you want to ask, is this serious science or is this myth? I want to say it's myth, not that that there's anything wrong with Jill Tarter as a scientist. She's a great scientist. I fully embrace everything scientific that said he does. I just want to say there's some theology being practiced here without a license. Well, here's Frank Drake. He and Carl Sagan were the ones that conceived of uh, the SETI research uh, project. He's uh, now retired. Um, and uh, Frank is now telling us what he hopes to see once contact with ETI is made. He says, everything we know says there are other civilizations out there to be found. Now, just recognize that there's no empirical evidence whatsoever that there's an ETI civilization. There's really good speculative reason uh, for thinking uh, this, but um, uh, Frank doesn't distinguish between speculation and empirical evidence. The discovery of such civilizations would enrich our civilization, heaven coming down to earth would enrich us, with valuable information about science, technology, and sociology. This information could directly improve our abilities to conserve and to deal with sociological problems, poverty, for example. So extraterrestrial science, technology, and sociology could help us overcome poverty. Cheap energy is another potential benefit of discovery as our advances in medicine. So advanced science can bring all these blessings uh, to earth. So even if we don't get the blessings of extraterrestrial science, just the sheer march of science on earth could bring these things as well. Well, um, I love Frank Drake's vision. I hope his dreams come true, but I think we just have to grant he's practicing theology uh, without a license. He's trying to import into his scientific vision um, a whole doctrine of the fall and redemption uh, that uh, was borrowed uh, from uh, religious beliefs uh, in the past. Um, so I would like to get invited to barbecues, both with the astrobiologists and the ufologists. Um, nobody's had barbecues during COVID, so that hasn't happened. And as uh, Richard said at the introduction, um, my colleagues and I at CTNS in Berkeley put together this book on astro uh, theology. Jose uh, is one of the uh, authors. And in recent years, uh, Margaret and I and Chris Corbelly have uh, done some things about space research that have religious components. Uh, but then uh, my interest in UFOs, I have to simply go somewhere else to do that. <laughs> my colleague, Bob Russell uh, <laughs> at CTNS doesn't want to have anything to do with that subject. Keep it away. So in sum, I think there are two things that astrobiologists and ufolog ufologists share is a scientific mindset. Um, I will grant that the astrobiologists are the ones that actually do the research and give us the data that we all um, benefit from. I do not want to be a reductionist and suggest that what NASA and SETI are doing are, is not good science. I think it's great science, et cetera. I just think there's an overlay as the science gets interpreted by the wider culture, an overlay of uh, the ETI myth. So here's my final quote from Seth Shostak, whom I mentioned at um, SETI. The question of whether UFOs are truly interstellar spacecraft needs to be addressed by careful examination of the claims. I don't know whether Seth has accepted any invitations to a ufologist barbecue, but it looks like he's ready. Bye-bye. Well, thank you very much for that, Ted. That was absolutely fascinating. I, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed that. I'm sure there'll be lots of uh, 
really interesting questions. I've got a few, but given you were talking about Jose's work and things like that, and you were wondering what he would make of some things, shall I sort of, the two of you like to very briefly have an exchange and then we can open it up to questions more generally. How does, does that sound? Is that okay, Jose? Putting you slightly on the spot, I sure. apologize. Uh, sure, I, I didn't get it. If you want me to participate now or to wait for another questions? Well, do you want to jump? Because Ted was talking okay, about yes, some of the work fine. that you've been that's doing fine. and the perspective you're uh, taking. Well, you want to... Thank you, Ted, for this uh, <laughs> wonderful presentation with many good points and provoking thought, I would say. I, I would like to start, uh, this is a comment uh, from my point of view, uh, what you mentioned about the scientific mindset, what uh, you clarify that you are talking in a cultural context. I think there is the problem uh, to see the ufologists with the astrobiologists. Um, and you, you gave the answer when you referred to the comment by Frank Drake, uh, saying that he's doing theology without license. And I think that's the problem with uh, ufologists. Uh, I don't want to be too aggressive in what I'm going to say. I try to be polite, but... Um, you don't have to be polite with me, Jose, just let it rip. <laughs> no, no, it's not about you. Uh, uh, because I, I answered the same question last week here in in Argentina, I gave a presentation and people asked me about this. Uh, so I, I, I made the same uh, introduction. Uh, not everyone uh, can do research. Uh, not everyone can do research. To drive a car, uh, you need a driver license. Uh, to do research, uh, you need to be, well, to be approved by the academic community, otherwise uh, your work is not serious. And the driver license to do research is the PhD or the doctorate. As far as I know, there is, as maybe I'm wrong, but uh, there is no university with a degree in ufology. Um, uh, to get a degree is not something uh, easy. I mean, you go to, you have to go through grad studies. Uh, you write your thesis. Uh, you are you have to publish papers that you are reviewed by peers. Uh, so there is a lot of work and effort to say a word in astrobiology. Um, again, uh, they they need to be credible uh, if they go through this. Uh, academic uh, process. Otherwise, uh, we have the same situation. I, I told this example that uh, should be, I think it's quite clear. Uh, here in Argentina, maybe uh, I'm not sure in the US now, uh, if you see the news in whatever uh, uh, newspaper on the web, you see the weather forecast, and you see the horoscope of the day. And it seems that they are at the same level. Uh, people may think that the same scientific work, uh, recollection of data that you have, uh, you need to produce uh, the forecast of the day, is the same like uh, giving you the horoscope of the day. Uh, people doesn't know that it's very complicated. There are many, very, complex uh, physical models to forecast the weather and say the, what temperature we're going to have. Uh, so this is one point. I, on the other side, I, I think um, we need to address, uh, now I think they are called unknown physical, what uh, UPA, I think is a, the unknown phenomenal, aerial phenomenon. Phenomena. Um, we need to address uh, from a scientific point of view, collecting data, analyzing the data. And I think it was last summer, about last summer in the Northern Hemisphere, that the US Congress published this uh, report on this 
topic. I, I read it carefully. And the, if I'm, maybe I'm wrong, I, I got the, the, the wrong motivation. Uh, but the motivation to do that was national security. That's right. In fact, uh, no. they, they mentioned in the report uh, Russia and China. And from the, what, what this is public, I don't know about the, 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 the report that is classified. I don't have any, any information about that, but uh, most of the uh, phenomena that were studied uh, could be explained naturally. But again, the, the main motivation uh, was national security. Uh, it wasn't the search of, uh, of extraterrestrial intelligence or analyzing possible UFOs or whatever. So I think uh, we need to be responsible as researchers and to explain uh, to the general public uh, the difference between being an astrobiologist and an ufologist. Though there are many, there, there might be some a common background, but I think uh, that's the only thing I, I, I would say. I'm sorry Good. if I was too, too long. Great. Good. I mean, I guess I kind of have a follow up on that then, um, Ted, which I, I think is so my perception from, from what you were saying, and I, you know, I I don't know much about the ufology uh, community, but from what you were presenting, it seemed quite clear that the uh, the ufologists were much more happy to have astrobiologists to their barbecues than the other way around. It was the astrobiologists. Oh, I think that's correct. And I, so I was interested in, you, you explained clearly that they are unhappy. You didn't go into an enormous amount of depth, although maybe I missed it in, in what it is that they're opposed to. So like one one of the people you referenced said it doesn't have the right smell or something like that. Um, what is, oh, well, they, oh, did he say like the evidence doesn't have the right smell or something like that? What, and I guess I can sort of imagine what he might be getting at, which is when I, from talking to astrobiologists, you know, they're, really are looking and you kind of refer to this they are looking very clearly data you know, they're looking at light being bounced through the atmosphere of distant planets from stars and doing all of this that and the other which is very impressive but then when you look at at least in the pop culture a lot of the ufologists are talking about much more subjective odd i mean a lot of it's just odd it, it doesn't it doesn't mesh together well other the I mean, is that, oh, well, I'm rambling, but is that the sort of thing he was driving at? Is that the sort well, of thing? I, I, I think that we're, we're talking about Chris Impey at the University of Arizona uh, Astrobiology Program. And I think Chris means what Jose was saying uh, a few minutes ago, namely, the research scientists who employ uh, rigorous methods and uh, double checking for confirmation, disconfirmation, uh, produce um, public data that everybody can grant uh, is, uh, is accurate. And I think but what he means by the smell test is that UFO researchers can't do that or don't do that. Uh, I think that's what he means. I could actually ask him on some occasion. Um, what I uh, do is I try to come into the conversation with cultural glasses and notice the high reverence that ufologists have for science. And uh, it's the same reverence that the scientists themselves have uh, for themselves. I will grant, according to the standards Jose just gave, you don't see the same high quality scientific research in the UFO community. It's not there. <laughs> uh, what you get is a scientific mindset, but you, you don't get uh, science of equal uh, caliber. When I go to a very large UFO meeting, we're talking 400, 800 people or something like that. 
it's a circus. You've got paranormal. You've got uh, tarot cards. You've got people called walk-ins who are hybrids of uh, extraterrestrial and terrestrial. And you get all the kooks, nuts, and wackos. Um, I love it, frankly. I, I just need to say I like being with the UFO people there. Uh, they have a sense of humor. They're creative, etc. But within that circus setting, there is this scientific mindset. A lot of the UFO uh, people have PhDs in the natural sciences, uh, etc. And they want it to be scientific in character. I can see why the astrobiologists do not invite ufologists to their barbecues. And frankly, I, I, I can't understand. I can understand that. Um, but um, culturally, I think, and this is where the theologian needs to come in, you need to understand science as a cultural phenomenon and not just its own self-understanding. Uh, that's where they kind of look alike. Yeah. And there is within the culture a great desire to have science be our savior. I mean, medical sciences prove that we can be healthier and live longer maybe science can save us from everything. And if you throw in the fact that religion, the fact, the belief that religion is the source of all evil <laughs> and science is allegedly uh, non-religious in character, um, therefore science could save us from the evils of religion. Now, on the faith, that, that's preposterous, absolutely preposterous. Yeah, it's widely believed by very intelligent people. And uh, uh, anyway, I, I just, yeah, so what I want to do is a cultural analysis that the theologian can get a hold of. And that's sort of what you heard me doing today. Oh, yeah. No, no, that definitely came, came through. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody else want to jump in either on this point or on a different point? Emad? You, uh... Uh, two quick things. Uh, one question, one comment. Uh, concerning science as a savior, uh, I used to use an essay when I taught at the university here by Ali Shariaki called Art Awaiting the Savior. And he said there's science, there's technology, and there's art, but art is the real uh, revolution. Science is just about studying nature as it is, technology is about efficiency and profit. Art, uh, art is about taking the ideal and make it real, believing in things that don't exist in this world. So th that's my automatically good. And I actually used the clip from uh, the Jackie Chan movie, Around the World in 80 Days, when they go into the art gallery thinking it's a science gallery. And you have uh, Phyllis Fogg saying, uh, trees aren't charcoal, uh, 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 grass isn't purple. And then he sees a painting of a man flying there, and a man cannot fly. But that's his dream, to create a flying machine. If you think in this overly scientific way, you restrict yourself to the rules of nature and forget invention innovation and adding, uh, doing the impossible, supposedly. Uh, now, the, the question is, why is this the most popular model of alien? Uh, yeah, it's a good, that's a good question. I don't know that particular book, but... Um, uh, uh, this is a short story book uh, for... Oh, is it? Uh-huh. Uh, Arabic, The Economist. Stuff. But it has the economy, oh, I see. The, uh, boy, I don't know that... Uh, that connection between the uh, between ET and money. I don't know that connection. That's interesting. <laughs> That's just the human thing. But yeah. why the specific image? The popular, the great. Right. Image? Well, in the 1970s uh, and 1980s, uh, there was a conflation for a period between New Age spirituality and UFOs. I mean, it was a connection with Bohmian physics and all kinds of things. The art of that time uh, that uh, depicted UFOs and aliens was very eschatological in character. The, uh, the, the flying saucer was like the new Jerusalem descending from the sky with brilliance and uh, salvation. And uh, I think Spielberg, when he did Close Encounters of the Third Kind in 1977, that's what he saw. And so the climax of that movie is the New Jerusalem descending 
uh, down to the Axis Mundi, Devil's Tower, <laughs> and uh, bringing us what? Immortality. You know, the dead people uh, came back to life again. Um, so I think uh, that sort of redemption theme uh, has been there in ufology already from the early 1950s. And uh, I think it got picked up then by Carl Sagan and Frank Drake uh, uh, in the, uh, the childhood of astrobiology. Richard, Richard, can I, can I make an, a comment? Yes, yes, um, yep. I, I think that Ted is right on in terms of there being a quasi-religious feeling to any approach to ETIs. But I just wanted to point out that that kind of uh, religious feeling as a movement emerges where there is a lack of data. And I wanted to mention two sources of data that are lacking right now. And I think Jill Tarda would agree that, you know, we have not surveyed the heavens. I mean, really. I mean, we've, we're barely learning how to survey, uh, how to pick up signals for different kinds of things. And we, we're barely touching the entire heavens that are available to us. So that's one source of data. The second source of data, I think is implied by Jose Funes's comment about national security. It, it itself, that comment, implies that there's another source of data about UFOs. And I think there is. And I think that the force of religion is being brought to bear to keep it quiet. There are a bunch of guys out there. I, and I know, I live in Washington. I was born here. I was raised here. I had a career here. There are a bunch of guys out there, mostly guys, few girls who've been out there and they've seen things. And they say to me, it do, we don't have anything that moves that fast. We don't have anything that moves that way. And they're out there and most of them have nice military pensions and they're not gonna say a damn thing. They're just gonna keep quiet. And they should keep quiet because they've sworn to go along with this. But you, that data is there. Their knowledge is there. And it peeks out every once in a while and everybody taps it down again and say, oh, it's just a bunch of crazy people. So the, I think the religiosity is being supported actually by the lack of data and the lack of serious consideration. I mean, there are many of us who were very, very disappointed by that report that came out. Uh, I think it was last year from the government. You know, I mean, come on. I've had better conversations in a, in a bar, you know, a Washington bar, you know. So that knowledge is out there, but they're not going to say anything not until they're allowed to. And so in this vacuum, religiosity emerges. That's my view. And that's how I tie in with Ted. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, no, good. good um, I mean, yeah, you know, no, it's, 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 I'm sure we'll be able to hear more about that when we have you and. Um, yeah. You're not gonna get, you're not gonna get it yet quite. You're not, not gonna yet. quite get it yet. It's coming out slowly. Does that mean Margaret is on the, uh, uh, the on, speaker's on the, calendar? No, no, no. I'm not trying to get it out. I don't want these guys to lose their pension. No, well, no, I'm just, uh, your, your work with Chris Carberly is so uh, interesting from other uh, uh, perspectives about what is likely to be happening as we put human beings uh, in space and uh, things like that. So I'm just thinking this group is going to benefit uh, by hearing from Well, you. one of the things that I've wanted to do is to find a place at the table for a theologian. Um, uh, psychologists have been early into designing space programs. They're mostly designed by engineers. 
Um, but there's no place at the table for a theologian yet. And uh, as I've said to a couple people, you know, if NASA went looking for a theologian, they would be probably going against our law. The American Constitution calls for the separation of church and state. And so there is no encouragement of worship in a federal installation. Now then, it's, it's been allowed on some spacecraft, but it cannot be encouraged and it cannot be required. That's against our law. So uh, how do you get theological input? Because these are people we're sending to space. These are people that pray to their God and yours and mine every night. And some people, as we've seen in the biographies, find religion off world. So if they're not prepared, if these programs do not, aren't informed by a theological input, then I'm worried that all of a sudden there's going to be some captain to some craft that says, not on my spaceship. Nobody's going to do this stuff on my spaceship. Somebody's going to say that at some point, and that's not going to be humane. It's not going to be humane. It's not going to be the way human beings need to be treated off world. So that's what I'm looking for. But, and I have, I'm looking for avenues to how to do this. And the best avenue so far that I've come up with is to link up with mental health people. Because I think that it's very well documented, a lot of research that supports worshipful experience leads to better mental health. So that's kind of, if you can get on a, kind of a mental, mental health angle, a health angle. But right now, I don't know of any theological input into space program. And uh, maybe I don't know. Could well, be. Uh, as I was, um... I was saying, Margaret, we're, we're going to have you to our YouTube viewers. We're going to oh, have yeah. you and yeah. Chris come and talk to right. us. Uh, I didn't mean to go, go on so long. I apologize. <laughs> no, no, not still. No, no, I was saying, but uh, I, I uh, get but, really, I really get excited about this because I just, there's got to be some kind of rules, regulation, law, something that allows people to pray on their way out to Mars. You know? The only thing I would say is do um, look up. Um, in the literally in the last few months, or maybe last year, um, Andrew Davison, part of yeah. our network, has right. been an Anglican priest, has been working with NASA. Um, but Good. you're right, it's very very new. Um, but yeah, right. he's and he's now had some funding from them, I think. Um, but anyway, he, it, to the YouTube viewer, we've got a recording of him. He was one of our first speakers. And Margaret, if you want to chat to him at some stage, let me. Let me no, that's, that's you know, fine. I'm, I'm glad to hear it. There was a there was a whole group of people that were supposed to have gotten NASA funding, and it was some kind of big myth, and it went all over the internet, and had people everybody believing that NASA was funding uh, clergy, and you know it was just wasn't true. So I'm glad Davison is is doing it. Um, yeah, I think I mean he was definitely acting as a consultant in some. Is he American how. or British? He's British, yeah, yeah. Okay, well. well. Let me just add a couple of comments. Uh, Andrew is at Cambridge. He holds the Starbridge chair there in science and uh, theology. He's a biologist by training. Right. And he did participate in the one-year seminar program at Princeton, which was co-sponsored by NASA and the Templeton uh, Foundation. Um, and uh, I, the, the, the news coverage was misleading, <laughs> to be sure, be, uh, because there were priests in there, but they were dealing with theological and ethical issues of space research uh, in the field of astrobiology. Andrew was one of a, maybe a dozen people uh, in that or something. Um, but some defenses of NASA came out in that controversy. I don't remember what they were. Shall we just just 
being mindful of the time, shall we circle back and have one or two more questions uh, on back on what Ted was talking about, and then we can we can wrap up. So, does anybody, perhaps some of the people who haven't spoken so far, do any of you have any questions? Or if not, Jose, any further comments or Emad? Um, just a comment that I I find that the these from uh, ufologists or scientists that they some of them see the salvation coming from it. There is a similar position in those transhumanists that are optimists, and they they, they may think that the salvation uh, will come from science and technology. That that's only my comment. No, no I, I think you're right. Um... Transhumanism is a really good example of this particular science of savior uh, component to the myth. Yeah. I guess my final question, Ted, I guess maybe just a suggestion. I guess it's more of a suggestion than anything. It would be interesting to bring in some some more philosophers into this some philosophers of science into this debate and looking at trying to really pin down you know with Karl Popper and people like that what what do we mean by science what is it that makes a hypothesis scientific I think a lot of the time scientists and the public at large they sort of know science when they see it and they sort of know data when they see it and they know quintessential pseudoscience when they see it but there's lots of stuff that's somewhere in the middle and it's very hard to figure out. So it'd be interesting to link this to some of the research on philosophy of science and how to define science and falsifiability and all of that sort of thing, I guess. Well, um, uh, yes. Um, now, philosophers of science are actually epistemologists for the most uh, part. Um, I, I uh, actually accept uh, Jose's description of what the scientist does and uh, how the scientific community is responsible for confirming uh, or disconfirming uh, discoveries, data, reports, published research, etc., and all of that. And I think <laughs> from a cultural point of view, the whole world should just applaud uh, the arrival of science for its achievements. And um, I think there are two proofs of the value of science. Number one, it, it has provided so much accurate information about the natural world, which is confirmable that our ancestors simply did not know. And then secondly, technology frequently confirms what scientists discovered in stage one, technology in stage two. So um, there is good reason for science to hold uh, the privileged position that it, it does uh, in, in our global culture. And philosophy of science, as insightful as it can be, um, uh, doesn't necessarily cha change that. I just want to mention with regard to philosophy back uh, in the days when we in Berkeley had this working relationship with the Vatican Observatory on dealing with cosmology and related matters, a number of the Jesuits were highly trained in Thomistic philosophy. And they um, found themselves uh, as bridge, bridge makers between uh, the basic empirical scientists on the one hand and the theologians on the other. Well, some of the Protestants did need that philosophy, but, but by and large, uh, it was the Thomas who were able to synthesize what's going on in empirical science on the one hand uh, and the uh, theologians who believe in God um, on the other. And uh, I think uh, that will probably continue to be the case that that particular strain in philosophy uh, will continue to play an important uh, synthetic role. 
Well, I, I certainly hope so, because that's I'm, I'm in the optimistic camp myself. So. <laughs> More questions? Okay, yeah, Emad, I think, yeah, one last question from Emad, and then we will wrap up. Um, a famous sci-fi guy in England, George Stone, said that traditionally British science fiction is very terrestrial. Uh, American science fiction is all about expansion and meeting aliens. And that's a product really of the frontier mythology and experience. Is UFOlogy more popular in America than, say, Europe or England? Is it a cultural phenomenon, like science? I was not able to hear the question okay. clearly. Uh, is UFOlogy more popular in America than in England? UFO cults and uh, people who believe. My, uh, I, I don't know how to measure it statistically, but ufology in the united kingdom has been really big for 70 years and uh it's big in america it's also um big in latin america it takes a slightly different form in latin america there's a little less scientific focus and <clears throat> more attention given to experiences with et etc um and the, in the soviet days of Russia, it was a very big topic, uh, etc. So, uh, no, it's not peculiarly um, American at all, as far as I can tell. Fascinating. Okay, well, I will um, say goodbye to my our YouTube viewers, and then if we want to talk a little bit afterwards, we can. Uh, YouTube viewers, thank you for joining us. I hope you found that interesting. I know that I did. If you enjoyed it, do uh, leave a like. And if you want to see more videos. Uh, well, like thank you, Richard. And thank you, colleagues. We have. Oh, well, no, thank you, Ted. Thank you very much, um, Ted. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yes. So do, do like and subscribe. And we'll look forward to seeing you in our next talk. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.